What's up, Ark Preteens? Pastor Dyson here, back with another Sunday video for you guys. We're going to get back to our regular Sunday lessons with the topics next week, and then I'll be putting out verse by verse videos when I am able to. Uh, but for this week, this is our last, I guess, weekly verse by verse video. I'm going to continue making them, but this is going to be the last Sunday, at least for a little bit, that we'll be having a verse by verse video for our Sunday video. Uh, and so I'm so thankful that you guys have decided to join me here on our Ark Preteens YouTube channel. Obviously, we can't be meeting uh, in person at church, and so this will have to do. But if you've missed any of our other videos that we've made, we made a lot of videos. We did a Free Talk Friday series uh, where I interviewed all, uh, all of our preteen leaders, and so you can go check that out and learn more about your preteen leaders. We have uh, Minecraft Mondays, we have the Clip of the Week. All those playlists, all those videos are linked down in the description. So if you missed any of our videos uh, thus far, after you watch our video right now, uh, you could go check out those videos and catch up on those. Today, we're going to be in Mark chapter 1, verse 12 to 13. And just like every week of our verse by verse series, I would encourage you to watch this with your Bible, with a physical Bible. I have mine right here with my notes uh, because I can't remember everything. I got to write some things down. Uh, but I do have my Bible with me. I would encourage you to have your Bible with you so you can underline things, circle things, highlight things, you know, write little notes in the blank space if you want to uh, as we go throughout these two verses because there's a lot, again a lot packed in, in just two verses in these two simple verses uh, and so we're going to go through that so i would encourage you to have your bible handy if you don't have a bible my email is also down in the description so send me an email request and i will get you a bible for free it's yours for life you can take it you can write your name on the inside cover you can under again you can do whatever you want so i will give you a bible for free just send me an email request we had a great time, I should say, before we get too far into it. We had a great time at Big Splash on Saturday. Uh, shout out to everybody that was there with us. Uh, it was a great time on Saturday. We had a great time at Big Splash, you know, water park, water slide, whatever you call it. Uh, so we had a great time there. So big shout out to Big Splash for having us. Uh, and we had a great time while we were there. So without further ado, let's jump into it. So before we get into the two verses specifically, let's do a brief little recap of what we've talked about so far. So remember that the theme of Mark's gospel is Christ as king, as Jesus is the messianic king. He, uh, he may not use, or he does use the word Messiah, but his focus is more on the kingship of Jesus. Because remember, Mark wrote this gospel to the Christians in Rome who were being persecuted for their faith, who were being killed and beaten up and discriminated against because of their faith in Jesus. And so Jesus is, or sorry, not Jesus, Mark is writing this gospel uh, describing Jesus to these people who were being uh, beat up and humiliated basically for their faith. And so Mark's focus, his thrust is Jesus is the triumphant king. Jesus is the king that's going to deliver the persecuted Roman Christians out from this oppressive uh, regime that they were under. And so we really need to remember that as we read because uh, their situation, the context that Mark was writing in is very important for our understanding of Mark's gospel. And so as we talked about last week, just a little recap, uh, the Messianic King was coming from a no name, nowhere region. Remember Nazareth and Galilee. Galilee was seen as this lesser uh, part of Israel. It was seen as this lesser region. Nazareth was like this no name, no, nothing good ever came from Nazareth town. And so they were, the Jews were expecting the Messi the Messiah to come from Jerusalem, the Holy city, but Jesus didn't. He comes from Nazareth in Galilee. And so he comes from a nowhere region, you know, no one really cares, no one really like, likes Galilee. Jesus approaches John the Baptist at the Jordan River, and remember we talked about Jesus was baptized not because Jesus had sin to confess and repent of, because we know that Jesus was sinless, but Jesus was baptized because God commanded that he would be baptized and also Jesus was baptized so he could identify with sinners. Remember we talked about Jesus is going to identify with sinners on the cross. He's going to become guilty even though he's innocent. He's going to take our guilt upon himself. And so in this baptism, we see this foreshadowing of the cross where Jesus is identifying himself with sinners. You know, sinners got baptized because they had sin to confess and repent. Jesus doesn't have that. But yet Jesus wasn't guilty, so he didn't have to die, and yet he did. He doesn't have to get baptized, and yet he is. And so we see Jesus is baptized because God commanded it to, so he could identify with sinners. Very important. And then we also saw that the Trinity was present at Jesus' baptism. The Trinity is God, you know, one in essence, but three in person. And so we have God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
And so we see the whole Trinity is present at Jesus' baptism. Obviously, Jesus is there because uh, he's getting baptized. We saw God the Father's audible voice say, this is my son with whom I, am, whom I am well pleased. And we saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove, not a dove. The Holy Spirit's not a dove. It, was, it descended like a dove very gracefully uh, and descended upon Jesus as an affirmation and, a, and an approval of Jesus' ministry that was about to begin. And so we see God approve of Jesus' ministry. And we see God grant Jesus the Holy the, the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit to perform his ministry. So he received an audible and a visual affirmation of his authority that, yes, this is Christ. This is the Messiah. Uh, you know, Jesus is the one that they've been waiting for, even though uh, he's going to do things and, and things are going to work out. Not at all what the people expected the Messiah to, to look like and do. Uh, but this is God saying, this is my son. This is the Messiah. So Jesus gets that affirmation. And so let's read about what happens right after that affirmation in Mark chapter 1, verse 12 to 13. If you don't have your Bible, I'll put it on the screen. Oh yeah, this was just a picture just to remind you of what the scene looked like. There would have been a lot more people because remember everybody was coming down from Jerusalem and all around Judea. And so, you know, there's Jesus in the red coat. Again, Jesus is not a white person. Uh, and then there's John the Baptist beside him with the hair and the, the clothes of a prophet. Uh, so there would have been a lot more people. But this is just kind of what it looked like. Now let's get into chapter 1, verse 12 to 13. If you don't have a Bible, it's on the screen in front of you. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild angels, <laughs> the wild angels, he was with the wild animals, and angels attended to him. Not wild angels, sorry, I misspoke. He was tempted with the wild. He was tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended to him. So, as we as we talked about, Mark's focus, the thrust of Mark's gospel, why he's writing, is to to show that Jesus is powerful, that he's the triumphant, victorious King, that the persecuted Christians in Rome don't need to fear about uh, the persecution that they're facing and the suffering that they're going through, because Jesus is their triumphant King, and so that's Mark's focus. And if Jesus is going to be the triumphant, victorious king, then he has to be able to be triumphant and victorious over Satan in this ongoing battle. And so uh, well, I'll, I'll explain more about what that means. But if Jesus is going to be this victorious, triumphant king, then he needs to be victorious over every aspect of earthly life. And so we saw he was affirmed by God and he received the Holy Spirit. And at once the Spirit sends him into the wilderness. This is the first thing the Holy Spirit does with Jesus. Jesus has received the Holy Spirit, uh, like the, the visible affirmation that he has the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, uh, the word that's actually used here, uh, sent, actually in Greek, a more accurate translation would be, and the Holy Spirit threw out. The Greek word is ekbalo, if you, if you care about that. Uh, the Greek word is ekbalo, which means literally threw out. The Spirit... Uh, sent him, the Spirit, threw out Jesus into the wilderness. And we don't have a very detailed account of what happens in the wilderness in Mark, but you can read a more detailed account in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4 if you would like to uh, after this video, or you can pause it right here. You can pause right here and go read the more detailed account there. Uh, I will reference it, but if you want to read it for yourself, you can either right now or after. And so the first thing that the Holy Spirit does is not, uh, you know, uh, empower him to do like this massive miracle and there's no singing there's no trumpets there's no angels jesus is sent out into the wilderness and the purpose the reason why jesus is actually being sent out into the wilderness is because he needs to display a greater power than the ruler of this world his arch enemy satan and you may be maybe thinking oh here's the highlighted one and you may be thinking uh, Satan's the ruler of the world. I thought God was the ruler of the world. Yes, God holds the whole world in his hands. Nothing happens in this world without God knowing. Uh, and, you know, God's always moving and acting. But the ruling authority, the one that's so influential, is actually Satan. And we can read about this in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, where it says, For our struggle, so this is talking about us, for our struggle on this earth is not against flesh and blood. It's not against other people, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And so Satan would be one of those spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm because Satan's not roaming the world uh, like in the flesh. He's in this 
this heavenly realm. He's in a realm that's not our physical realm that we live in. We're not fighting against other people. We're fighting against the forces of evil. And so the, the reason why the Holy Spirit actually sends Jesus out into the wilderness is because if Jesus is going to be this triumphant king that's going to encourage the persecuted Roman Christians, then Jesus has to display that he has a greater power, an undefeatable power over Satan, who is the evil ruler of this world, who, who you know causes evil and evil things happen. God is always in control. God is never out of control. Satan can never surprise God. But Satan does these things that are intended for evil, and God always redeems evil for good, for his good purposes, I should say. God is always working out his plan. Satan cannot thwart God's plan, but he's going to try to. So the Holy Spirit sends Jesus into the wilderness. And a couple things that we need to know about why this is important is the wilderness is isolated, obviously. People don't live in the wilderness. When Jesus goes into the wilderness, only the Holy Spirit is accompanying him. He's not going with friends. He's not going uh, with uh, his mentors or his teachers that he might have had in the synagogues when he was growing up as a boy. He's going alone. He doesn't have disciples at this point. Uh, you know, his family's not there. Jesus is sent out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit, only with the Holy Spirit, to be tempted by Satan in order that Jesus would display that he has a greater power than Satan, which would then show us that Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God, that he does have power over Satan. Because what is Satan's main tool in this earth? It's sin. Satan wants to tempt us and pull us into sin. Satan can't make us sin. He can put temptation in front of us that as we give into it leads us into sin, but Satan cannot make us sin. He puts temptation forward and tries to draw us into sin. And so we as human beings, we're powerless against uh, sin and temptation. Uh, given the opportunity to go into temptation before we've been saved, before we've been filled with the Holy Spirit at our salvation, at our conversion experience, before any of that, we are powerless to resist temptation. We may be able to resist uh, certain forms, uh, but Satan is very tricky about how he works. And so we, are utter we were utterly powerless against temptation. And so Jesus is going into the wilderness because in order to identify with sinners on the cross, just like he did in his baptism, he needs to identify us in temptation. Jesus needs to be tempted. It doesn't mean Jesus is going to give in to the temptation because we know Jesus never sinned. But if Jesus is going to identify with us, sinners, then Jesus needs to be tempted to again display that he has a greater power, that he is the perfect man, he is the son of God. He needs to display these things. And what's interesting is this is right after Jesus' baptism. We, we, we talked about this was a glorious occasion. Uh, you know, this is the start of Jesus' ministry, like things are kicking off. And we don't get, we, there's nothing heavenly, there's nothing majestic following this coronating baptism. There's no angels descending, there's no trumpets, there's no bright lights. He's baptized and then the Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness utterly alone. And so this is, this is not the, the, the picture that we have when we think of a triumphant king. Because we have the herald of the king, John the Baptist, who announced Jesus was coming. And then we have this triumphant Baptism if, you, baptism, if you will, where this coronation is happening, where he's becoming the king, but then he gets sent into the wilderness by himself. But it's to overcome temptation, to overcome Satan. Jesus needs to display his full power and his total authority over all things on earth and in heavenly realms. So that's why Jesus is sent out into, into the wilderness. Uh, the, the area uh, where he went, uh, would be by the Jordan, probably on the road from Jericho to Jerusalem, around that area. A very scary area. It was called Jeshimon. Uh, so this is actually a picture from Jeshimon. Whether Jesus went to this specific, w the places in this specific photo, we're not sure. But this is kind of what it would look like. I know the picture is a little bit pixelated, but it's very barren. No water. Uh, to make matters worse, uh, we'll, I, we'll actually keep reading. I won't spoil it. Let's keep going. Let's move on to verse 13. I told you, we're going quick today, but there's a lot in here. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended to him. And so what we need to know about the wilderness is the wilderness was actually described by Moses in Deuteronomy 8, verse 15. Uh, Moses says, he led you, he being God, 
God led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of a hard rock. And so you can just see uh, this picture of what the wilderness looks like. No water, you know, thirsty, venomous snakes, scorpions, uh, cliffs, ravines, all these things going on. And God had to bring the people water from a rock that, that Moses uh, struck with his staff or spoke to. I, ca I can't remember the story exactly. Uh, but we see that this terrain is brutal. There's rocks, cliffs, ravines. Uh, to make matters worse, we, we can read uh, there was the wild animals, the wild beasts were there as well. The venomous snakes and poisonous scorpions. So this is not a comfortable place to be. This is not uh, a safe place to be. This is a very dangerous, very deadly place, this this wilderness of Jeshimon, if you will. Uh, this this is not at all what we expect a newly crowned king uh, to to be wandering around in. We're expecting, you know, you know, the castle and the throne and the kingdom. We're expecting a, a, a crown of solid gold studded and embedded with diamonds, rubies, and emeralds to fall down from heaven and perfectly place itself on Jesus' head. And yet, he goes out into this wilderness with the wild animals. I like how Mark includes that detail. Like, he's not just in the wilderness, but the wild animals, you know, scorpions, snakes, uh, lions uh, in this wilderness. And so, th this is not a place where you would at all expect, expect Jesus to be. And if you want to think about temptation, think about the very first temptation. Think about Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were tested, they were tempted by Satan in the Garden of Eden. They were tempted in this perfect paradise that God had created for them. And they were tempted together. Adam and Eve were together. There was two people there. There was a sense of community and relationship in which they were tempted. And Adam and Eve, with each other, like living beside each other, with each other, in this perfect paradise, even they fell into temptation. And we see that Jesus, he doesn't have an Eve or an Adam. He's all alone, like we said. He only has the Holy Spirit, but he's all physically alone. And he's not in God's perfect paradise that was created just for him. He's in this, this arid, dangerous, really sketchy wilderness of Jeshimon. And so this is not at all what we're, like, why is the this triumphant, victorious king in this wilderness? He should be on the throne. He should have a crown. And yet he's being tempted, not in perfect paradise, and he has no one with him. There's no one to help him. What's significant that Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days is because uh, the Old Testament, uh, we would say faith giants, Moses and Elijah, they were also in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. They also spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, and they were also fasting. We know that Jesus uh, was fasting. He did, actually didn't eat for 40 days. You can read, uh, read about that again in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4. So Jesus hasn't eaten. He hasn't uh, drank anything for 40 days in this wilderness with no water to drink anyways, and with all these animals going around that Jesus is not eating. And so we could see that also Moses and Elijah did these things. Moses, a great prophet. Elijah, a great prophet. And you could, in a sense, Jesus was a prophet as well. He was speaking on behalf of God, but he was also a priest in that he was approaching God on behalf of the people. So that's why we call Jesus both a priest, a prophet, and a teacher. Uh, there's a lot. Uh, that's not important to what we're talking about, though. And so we can see that this wasn't something uncommon. But think about when you didn't eat. Maybe you skipped lunch or a breakfast, or maybe you didn't eat for a day. You remember the next day how you were so hungry, how you were incredibly hungry and you almost felt weak, like you didn't have enough energy? Imagine that times 40. Jesus didn't eat for 40 days and 40 nights. That's over a month. That's about six weeks that Jesus has not eaten and he has not drank anything. And so not only is Jesus alone in the wilderness, in this dangerous wilderness, and not only is he being tempted by Satan, but he is at the physically weakest place point in his earthly body because Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully man. And so Jesus got hungry and Jesus probably sweat in the, in the blazing sun of the wilderness. And so Jesus is at his physic, physically weakest point. So again, Adam and Eve got tempted. They were together in perfect paradise. Their bellies were full. And now here's Jesus all alone in the wilderness at his physically weakest point. Jesus was at his weakest when he was tempted. He didn't have food. He had no support. Nobody was encouraging him. 
Uh, you could say that God encouraged him at his baptism when he said, you are my son with whom I am well pleased. But now Jesus has gone over a month without any encouragement or support from anyone. And so Jesus, at the point of his temptation, was at his weakest point. He wasn't being tempted at his strongest point. And, you know, he's God, so he's infinite strength. But he's being tested, tested at his humanly weakest point. And this is to display that Jesus is not only a king, but he's also a suffering servant. Oh, I'm not going to look. We're not going to look at that verse yet. Jesus is not only the triumphant, victorious king, but he's also the suffering servant. And you may be thinking, like, what, what does that mean? Well, Jesus is the triumphant king and that he wins the victory over death, as we know from the cross and the resurrection. And he's bringing a new kingdom where he's going to save his people uh, from eternal death and eternal uh, judgment by God. Uh, and so he's the king in that sense, but he's also the suffering servant and that he goes to die on the cross for us in our place. Kings don't lay their lives down for their people normally, not a normal king. Kings like to hold on to their power, but Jesus took his kingly authority and his power and he laid it down. He went to the cross as the suffering servant. He suffered to serve us, to give us a way to be saved from our sin. And so Mark's, we'll see this throughout the rest of Mark as we continue this verse by verse series. But Jesus is the triumphant king, but he's also the suffering servant. And so Jesus will be exalted by God. He will be praised. He will receive glory. But right now, God's will for Jesus's life was also his humiliation because Jesus was also humiliated on the cross. People were making fun of him, laughing at him, spitting on him. They were uh, playing games to win his clothing. They were feeding him sour water. Uh, and stale bread. And so not only is Jesus exalted as the high king, as the messianic king, but he's also humiliated as the suffering servant. And you're thinking, how can he be both a king and a suffering servant? How can he be exalted and humiliated at the same time? Well, he's the son of God. He's fully God and fully man. And so it's this divine paradox that we can't quite understand. But in this episode, this is Jesus' humiliation. And if the baptism that Jesus had to undergo was God's will, you know, God commanded that Jesus would be baptized, so he did it. God's will for Jesus is now that he would be humiliated and tempted in the wilderness. And so Jesus went and did that. And so it was God's will for all of these things to happen, for the baptism and for the wilderness. And because Jesus never sinned, he can never go against God's will. He's perfectly in tune with the Father. Uh, so he can't go against God's will. And so he does whatever the father commands him to. And so when he is exalted, it's because the father has commanded that he be exalted. When he is humiliated, it's because the father has commanded that he be humiliated. And so it's this divine paradox that he's both this victorious king, but also this humiliated suffering servant. And so Jesus' hunger, the 40 days and nights without eating, uh, his rejection by not being able to be around anybody and even his death in the future at the end of Mark's gospel and then the resurrection these are all part of his hum of his humiliation this is something that God has commanded would happen that he would be both exalted and humiliated and it's you know it's hard to explain and hard to describe but it's interesting to note that when Satan actually tempts Jesus Satan never tempts Jesus to sin in the sense that we understand sin Satan never tempts Jesus to lie. Satan never tempts Jesus to steal. What Satan tempts Jesus to do, again, you can read about the specific temptations in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. What Satan is tempting Jesus to do is to forego, is to, is to go around his humiliation. The first temptation, or Jesus, as we can see from Mark, was being tempted by Satan. So this is a continuous verb. It means throughout all 40 days, Jesus was being tempted. But in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, we get three temptations that Satan, Satan puts before him kind of at the end of the 40 days. Satan first says, well, you're the son of God. You're the king. You shouldn't be hungry. Tell those rocks to become bread and then you can eat. So Satan says, why are you being humiliated and not eating? Remember, it was God's will that Jesus be humiliated. So Jesus has to go along with this. And so Satan prays on that. And he says, if you're the son of God, you're the king. You deserve to eat. Kings deserve to eat. And you have power. You could turn those rocks into bread. And what does Jesus say? He quotes Deuteronomy. He quotes scripture to Satan. He says, man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus understands that he must be humiliated. and He must undergo this because it is the will of the father. 
the next temptation by Satan. Satan takes, a, Satan takes Jesus onto a high cliff and he shows him all the nations of the world. And Satan says, you're the son of God, you're the king. You should be able to rule over all these nations. And Satan says, I rule over all these nations. So if you bow down and worship me, I'll make you king over all these nations. But Jesus knew that God was going to make him king. And it was also God's will that Jesus be humiliated. And so Jesus cannot bow down to Satan and give up his humiliation for earthly power. And so Jesus doesn't. Again, he quotes another uh, passage from Deuteronomy. And then the final temptation, Satan takes Jesus to, the, to, the, to a high point of the temple in Jerusalem. And Satan says, you're the son of God. You can jump off the building and gracefully you know, land on the ground without breaking a bone or bruising your foot. And everybody will believe that you're the son of God. Why don't you do that? Uh, you can see how Satan is trying to tempt Jesus to give up the humiliation. Satan's saying, you don't need to be humiliated. You can do whatever you want. Trying to get him to sin and go against the will of God. And the will of God was for him to be humiliated. And each time Jesus quotes scripture to him and stays in the posture of suffering servant in his humiliation. And this tempting in the wilderness, these 40 days of temptation and the last three temptations that we read about in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, these weren't the first temptations because we can read in Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, the high priest being Jesus, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. And so this temptation by Satan, the 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, is not the first time Jesus has been tempted. The last three temptations... Uh, are not the f f first time Jesus is being tempted. Jesus was tempted as, as he was a child, when you were a child. Jesus was tempted when he was a preteen, as you are preteens. Jesus was tempted as when he was a teenager, a youth student, as our youth students are. Jesus was tempted when he was a young adult, like I am. He was tempted in every single way. He experienced everything we experienced, and yet he did not sin. He never went against the command of God. So if God commanded him to be humiliated and to be a suffering servant, he did that as evidenced by the cross. He laid his life down for us, for our salvation, to save us from God's wrath and judgment. Uh, and then it was God's will that he be exalted and rise again uh, out of the tomb. And so he did that as well because God commanded him to rise and be exalted. So Jesus rose and was exalted. Uh, and so Jesus was tempted just like we are. This wasn't the first time. And yet he never sinned. He perfectly obeyed God's commands and God's will. And this is important because if Jesus is to be the triumphant king, he has to be able to conquer temptation and sin. If Jesus did not conquer temptation, sin, and by extension, Satan, then that would be proof that he was not the messianic king that was coming to save his people and establish a new kingdom. If Jesus failed in the wilderness, we know he didn't, but if he did, that would have been proof that he was not the king that had been prophesied. And so this whole, these two verses, you know, there's a lot here. And you, again, the extended version is in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. You can go read it there. Uh, but this whole episode and what Mark is using this is to show that before Jesus even began his ministry, Jesus hadn't done a miracle yet. He hadn't healed anyone. He had no disciples. He was all alone. Before Jesus even started his ministry, he conquered Satan. He showed power over evil. And so if Jesus is going to be the triumphant king, the victorious king, and if he's going to have a perfect, sinless, holy life, if he's going to live it and have a powerful, God-ordained ministry, then he has to be able to conquer Satan, temptation, and sin. He has to be able to do these things. And so Mark includes this, uh, and this is part of a, of a, uh, a broader set, uh, and we'll talk about it. There's three kind of subsections as Jesus begins to enter his ministry. And so this first section is showing that Jesus has power over Satan. He has power over evil, total and absolute power and authority over Satan. He was tempted in every single way and yet did not give in. And then we see at the end, uh, he was with the wild animals. We talked about that. And then the angels attended to him. And so Jesus is tempted by Satan. He resists him for 40 days, 40 nights. And then the last three temptations, Jesus resists them, quotes scripture, and he does not sin. And the Father, God, sends angels down to Jesus. These angels were probably bringing food to nourish him, to attend to him or to minister to him. So they ministered to his physical needs for food and water and, and drink. So they brought him things to eat. Uh, and also on top of caring for his physical needs, uh, they also 
the, these angels coming down because we know you can read uh read read you can watch the video that we two videos we did about angels in our sunday lesson playlist down below but uh the angels are directed and commanded by god and so the fact that the angels showed up means that god was watching jesus the whole time so jesus knew that the father had sent the angels and god sending the angels acted as an approval divine approval uh, of jesus's coming ministry that he was about to start and so the angels come they feed him, they care for him, and they act as divine approval from God the Father for Jesus' coming ministry. And so this little snapshot of a story serves to show us that effective ministry actually begins with triumph over temptation. Uh, here's a picture of the angels coming down. Whether Jesus was lying down, we don't know. It, it probably, probably was a taxing thing for him. Again, he was at his physically weakest point. So they come down, they minister to him. But... It goes to show us that effective ministry first begins with triumph over temptation. Jesus was about to begin his ministry. He was about to go preach and heal and call disciples and establish the church. He was about to do all these things. But before he did that, he had to overcome temptation. And so what does that mean for us? Uh, that means that when we desire to do ministry, when we desire to, to do kingdom work, to preach the gospel, uh, to tell our friends about Jesus, uh, to be a, a shining light in the world, that it has, it must begin with us triumph, triumphing over temptation. But we can't do that. We can't do it like Jesus did it because Jesus was God. He was fully God and fully man. And so he had the supernatural strength and power to resist Satan. But we don't have that power. As we can read in Romans uh, 8, verse 9 to 11, we don't have that power by ourselves. We can't do it. Or Paul writes, you, however are not in the realm of the flesh. So we we exist because we have bodies, but we're not in the realm of the flesh. We're in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. And so what, what this is saying, this verse nine, is that when you belong to Christ, when Christ is your savior, when he saved you, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit resides within you. But verse 10, but if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, you know, we still die. The spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus, that's God, from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. And so what Paul is getting at here in this uh, excerpt from Romans is that you don't have the spirit the you don't have the strength to triumph over temptation and sin in your physical body but when you belong to Christ when you acknowledge that Jesus has saved us from sin and death and from the wrath of God when we acknowledge that we are given the holy spirit the holy spirit resides in us and now we live spiritually we still have physical bodies and we still physically die but the spirit gives us eternal life because of righteousness and so the holy spirit gives us this strength the same spirit that raised jesus from the dead is now alive in us giving us life and giving us that strength to fight temptation and so effective ministry begins with the triumph over temptation and you do not have that strength on your own but when you accept and acknowledge jesus christ as lord and savior the holy spirit is residing within you then the holy spirit provides you that strength uh, to continue and to live righteously and to live a holy life and so that's the practical application for us today and that's what we can learn from this scene in the wilderness is that jesus was the perfect man he did not sin he resisted temptation uh, at every point and even in his weakest moments when he was utterly alone starving nobody with him he still resisted temptation and the same spirit that is with him is now with us and so temptation no longer has power over your life. Sin no longer has dominion in your body. You have new life. You have new power with the Holy Spirit. And that's something that we can thank Jesus for, that we don't have to do it on our own, that we don't have to figure it out because he's already done it for us. He went before us and did what we could not do. And that's good news, preteens. So would you guys bow your heads, close your eyes, and pray with me as we close. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for another Sunday that we can come together virtually uh, and to read your word and to study it and understand it. Even though it was only two verses, there was so much packed in there, so many good details and things that your Holy Spirit inspired Mark to write down for the persecuted Christians in Rome. And I thank you that we're able to learn from it 
and that we're able to apply it and that we can see that uh, effective ministry actually starts with triumph over temptation, that Jesus, before he began his ministry, he resisted temptation. And even though that we are powerless to resist temptation and sin on our own, that your Holy Spirit residing within us gives us that power to resist uh, and to live a holy righteous life. And so we thank you that we don't have to do it on our own or figure it out on our own, but that you have gone before us. Jesus, we thank you that you have experienced everything we experienced, that we're never alone because your Holy Spirit is with us, guiding us and leading us. And I pray as we go about our weeks, Father, that you would give us opportunities to do ministry, to share your gospel, to tell people about you, and that you would keep us from temptation and keep us from evil by the power of your Spirit. Uh, that you would order and guide all of our steps and all of our decisions that we make this week, uh, and that you would be the Lord of our lives, that we would trust you, and that we would look to you in all things. I pray that you would bless our Sunday lunches and the hands that are preparing them. Uh, I pray you bless our conversation, God, uh, with the people that we're eating lunch with, whether they be friends, family, or even strangers, uh, hopefully socially, physically distanced with masks on. Uh, I pray that you would be with us, that the food would nourish our bodies, and that we would have a great week this coming week. And so we thank you, we love you, we trust you, and we pray and ask all these things in your holy and precious name. Everybody said amen, amen, amen. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our other uh, videos, either on a Sunday or midweek as we continue to make verse by verse videos and Sunday lesson videos. Again, we'll be back with normal Sunday lesson videos next week. Uh, so thank you guys so much. I love making these videos for you guys. I love that we can study the Bible together. I'm really passionate about studying the Bible and teaching the Bible. So I'm glad that I'm able to share these things with you so that we can all benefit from this. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Every week. Oh, did I skip? No, I didn't skip anything. Uh, every Monday, we have Minecraft Mondays. So I know I missed last week because my closet broke. Like I had these storage containers on my closet shelf and they were so heavy that the shelf actually collapsed and my whole closet, like the wall was a mess. My, my dad had to go in and fill the holes in the drywall and we had to find the studs and we had to install a whole new closet unit, but we got it fixed. And so I wasn't able to play Minecraft last week because we were doing that. But if enough people are online tomorrow, I will be online tomorrow playing Minecraft at around 1 p.m. Uh, if you want to play with us, we have our own Arc Preteens Realm. Send me an email. Uh, it's on the PC Java edition, not Bedrock, not the console edition, not Windows 10. It's on Java PC edition. So if you'd like to play Minecraft with us, you can play Minecraft with us there. Uh, and it's going to be a good time. If not, I'll turn on the live stream if there's people on and I'll be live streaming it. So you can come hop in the chat and you can write, you can write a comment. You can come hang out, talk with me, ask questions. Uh, you can do whatever. And so that's going to be happening tomorrow. Every Friday at 7 p.m., we meet at Trout Lake Park or John Henry Park, if you if you want to call it. We meet in the southeast corner where that red marker is on your screen, uh, right under a big tree in the open field. Uh, and so if you would like to come every Friday at 7 p.m., we meet, we throw the frisbee, throw a football, you know, play volleyball, uh, talk. We play cards, uh, you know, go fish, Uno and what have you. And so we have a good time uh, and, uh, on Fridays at 7 p.m. And it's just a time where we can come together and hang out and see each other. Uh, I do encourage that you bring a mask. We do want to be safe and very careful. Uh, we will be following all hygienic procedures. We'll stay physically distanced as much as possible uh, and we'll have hand sanitizer. But I do encourage you to bring a mask uh, just to be safe. We do want to be as careful as possible as our province reopens. We don't want COVID to spike again and we don't want to be part of the problem. And so we just want to be careful and we want to protect our families. We don't want to take the virus back to them. Uh, and so we just want to be careful. But I would encourage you to join us every Friday, 7 p.m. at Trout Lake Park in the southeast corner. Uh, I don't have a big splash announcement because that was on Saturday. That was yesterday. Uh, again, we had a great time. If you missed it, sorry you missed it. Uh, but if you were there, shout out to you. You get a little shout out. Uh, I'm glad you were there. And so all that to say, I hope you guys uh, had a great week last week. And I hope God is with you this week. Well, I know God will be with you this week. But I hope as he orders and guides your steps, uh, that you would experience some pretty incredible things, uh, that you would have fun, uh, that you would, you know, have a great time spending time with your families and with your siblings. Uh, and I just pray that God continues to do great things uh, in your life and through your life. And so uh, I thank God for you guys every day and I'm praying for you. Uh, I love you guys. Uh, tell your families I said hi. 
Uh, and I hope to see you soon. Hope to see you either on a Friday or, you know, whenever the church is able to open back up on Sundays again. I hope to see you soon. But until then, God bless you guys.